Yo, what's good, motivators? Welcome to another episode of Tuesdays with 2J. And today, as promised, I'll be speaking about my last event that I had in Rustenburg that was really very dramatic. And then I'll speak about my move to Pretoria. So like I said in the previous episode, we used to meet every Saturday at the Rustenburg Library where we used to do ciphers and battles. But eventually we decided to form like a collective crew called Rust Proof, which means Rustenburg Professionals Uniting for Evolution. And the purpose for this was to do events, to raise funds, to pay for people's mixtapes and albums, or maybe buy a studio to pay for everybody's recordings. And we did a trial run by doing our first event in Labani at the Labani Hall, but people didn't want to buy tickets. I don't know why, but they didn't want to buy tickets, and we eventually let them come in, and we performed just to get our name out there. It was understand it was 50 people performing, so it was like a festival type of thing. But we actually ran at a loss because we had to still pay for the hall. So we sat down and restructured in what way can we actually move forward and make people pay for this. So we decided to look for a club in Rustenburg, and I wouldn't mention the club's name for obvious reasons. So we went to the club and we spoke to the owner and what is the best way to work with them. And they said that it's best that we sell our own tickets, but we cannot sell to our regulars. So I said, okay. And we went to print out tickets and we gave it to all 50 members. We gave them 10 tickets each to sell. But fast forward, when we came to the event, most of the artists were saying that no, people saying that they must still pay, pay taxi fare, and 20 rand is too much. Like I said, Rustenburg, it's very difficult to pursue your creative journey. But for the people that did come, we decided to do our event. Setting up the mics for the first performance. But suddenly I heard a loud noise from the bar of bottles falling. And one of my friends came running towards us and all I heard him say was, we need to get 2 out of here. And the closest to the sound area, the stage, was the balcony. So we ran out of the balcony and closed the sliding door because right after that, there was a huge fight that started uh, from the bar. And people were fighting from there. People were hitting each other with pool sticks. The whole club started to fight. And I don't know what happened. Where did all this begin? Eventually, security uh, company comes through, uh, escorted everybody outside. Now everybody is out in the streets. And we are all on the balcony. All the rappers, all the... All like all the organizers of the event are on the balcony. Suddenly I see a bottle fly out of the sky and hit the wall above us. And my friends decided they need to cover me with their bodies so that at least the bottles won't hit me. And we don't know what, what's going on. Like, why are people throwing bottles now? Eventually it quieted down and the security like checked on us. Everything was calm. We don't even know really what happened. The The owner of the venue was very upset. He called us into the office. It was really a mess. I don't know where it all started. Um, but yeah, we went home and mind you, like going home, like ever since we've been organizing this event, we've been walking up and down. So even that time of the night, we were walking. And trust me, Rustenburg used to be very safe. You could walk 3 a.m. from town back home. And also it felt like a small city because town was like 10 to 20 minutes away. But yeah, <laughs> after that event, I just felt like, you know what, I give up. I tried my best. Rastenberg is really just not ready for a hip-hop industry. Maybe by now, I mean, that was many years ago. Maybe, maybe by now they have actually an industry that I do not know of as yet. But yeah, that's when I decided uh, it's time that I moved to Pretoria. So moving to Pretoria, I decided to lay low for a while to observe the game, what is actually different here. And I think it was kind of difficult because I used to be part of a, a hip-hop battle site. And I thought people wouldn't recognize me 
in Pretoria, and when there were ciphers at the State Theatre. And as I was approaching this one cipher, somebody recognized me uh, from the website and asked me to come cipher. And that's not really what I wanted to do. But yeah, I just dropped a few lines and people were amazed. But thereafter, I went back into hiding. I didn't want anyone to know. But I was there for every event at the State Theatre, looking at all the people I look up to. From your Barfosa, uh the Anvils, all, all the crews that were still crews, most of them are all solo artists right now. And yeah, so after like one year, I was like asking around, where can I find a studio? And that's when I found Lection Studio 48 Studios. I know it's a very weird name, sounds like there's 48 studios, but it is a clever name because it was his, his apartment number at some flat. So I went to record my first album there by him, so I recorded my first album there called 16 Bar Wire because it had 16 tracks. And to me, I felt like your album must feel like a verse. And yeah. So he quoted me like 2005 to do the whole album, which was very cheap. Uh, but yeah, I paid it off over six months, uh, over the six months that we were recording the album. And once the album was done, I got it uh, professionally printed and everything. And then I started with the marketing. Uh, called hype for the interview and some of them were surprised because they didn't know that I'm actually a rapper. Uh, they only saw me at events. So I got my first interview at hype. I went to 20 FM and then I got the opportunity to perform at Baseline. We were collecting clothing and food parcels and blankets for the people that were attacked during the xenophobic attacks. So it was many years ago. And from that, in, from that performance, I got an interview um, on Year Street Radio again on Swanee FM. Um, so yeah, everything was actually going well from there. But I was still struggling in a way because I felt like I'm alone, I'm doing everything on my own. And this was where I decided to actually try and form a crew or find a producer. And that's where I met uh, Chef, Mr. Chef, as they call him because he's a cook in the making beats. <laughs> I could not pay Chef at the time to produce me, but I worked out a barter agreement with him that I'll give him 20 hours a month to do whatever he wants in studio, whether it's making beats or recording artists or recording himself. And after like two weeks of working, he suggested that he would like to do his album, Hustle's Ambition, in the studio, and he would also like to feature me. So it was more like a collective album of different artists, but all the beats would be made by him. And it featured artists like Crossword, Decency, myself, um, Ether Versus, so many artists that he also brought on. And the beauty of this was that Chef brought people and I brought people that we all knew to record this album and we were basically strangers to each other but eventually we became like brothers and to me it felt like this was the dream I had all these years ago with Rust Proof and maybe I could implement that same dream and idea here. So I spoke with Cross and Chef and asked them if we can actually amalgamate all our companies together to form one umbrella company. And by then we actually formed the name Heat Mason, which actually means Heat Architect. Because we saw in the dictionary, Mason means architect. But it was also a bit of a shock therapy thing where if someone sees the name, they might think we're part of a secret organization, which it wasn't like that. But when we started with Heat Mason, it was very weird. Like. The performances we attended, the music we were putting out, the interviews we were getting, all the hype that we were creating, within a matter of six months, it really seemed like we're part of a secret organization. Because like, <laughs> things were going so well for us and honestly, I don't know like what happened after the six months because like, it may be ego or it may be uh, misunderstandings or 
different opinions from other people. Like nobody actually knows why most why did Heath Mason break up after all that time. People started their own camps or people went solo. But ah, it's like that's what happens when people grow up, I guess. I mean, most of us are still in contact with each other. And I think that it was time for us to go our separate ways and to start our own ventures. But at the time, it was really fun. But in the coming weeks, I think what I'll try and do is get some of the members on the show for an interview so we can just reminisce on the past and speak about where we are today and plans for the future. So do keep a lookout for that one. And with that, I would like to thank you for listening. Please do keep sharing the podcast. Let's get more people to listen. And please do follow me on my socials. See you next week at Tuesdays with 2J.